Okay, so I'm going to introduce you the last guest speaker that we have for um, this season. Next week I will be back and I'm excited to give a great message for you guys again. And I'm a, I hope you are excited to have me back. But um, today we have a very great friend of mine. Before I introduce him, a few things that you are, can do to help us to take this ministry forward, to take these messages forward. And I just want to explain quickly what we are doing. We are really passionate to help people with their, with their mental wealth in a spiritual and in a godly way. But we have, we, we have realized that, you know, there are many people out there struggling with anxiety and you know depression and fear because of many things that happened and as believers as children of god we are really passionate in helping these people all over so you know we, we're not just doing um, youtube videos we are actually doing ministry with people and your financial contribution really helps us a lot so thank you guys for giving if you feel led by god to contribute financially to us and to this ministry our banking details will be on the screen we really thank you so much for doing that please like please subscribe please comment please ring the bell and please send this message to as many people as you can um, because we do believe it's going to help a lot of people. So today we have a, a Dirk Swart, a, a person that I really look up to. Dirk is a life coach and he's also a leader in his church and in his, in his community. A brilliant speaker and you know we also both of us are playing for our church's band. He's actually my leader in the band. A coach to me in many ways. So thank you so much Dirk for um, sharing a message with us on our Theanos platform. We, we're really looking forward to what you have to say. I, I love you. I respect you. I really look up to you. So thank you for sharing and I hope Hope you guys will enjoy this message as much as I know I'm going to. God bless you. Hello everyone, it's great to be with you again. Thank you so much Fiona's for another opportunity to speak to your people. And so I was once again asked to speak on relationships. And when I think of relationships, obviously putting that thing on steroids, uh, we are going to be speaking about marriage specifically. Uh, although I know that a lot of people that's watching this channel is not necessarily married yet. Okay, these are incredible things to understand before you get into marriage because prevention is always better than cure. These are incredible things. So whether you're single, dating, engaged, married, you might be divorced. Um, this is incredible, um, incredibly important. And the reason why I'm so confident to say that this will add a lot of value is, you know, I'm in the privileged position as a life coach. Although I work with people on all eight of their life areas, I do specialize in relationships and I do a lot of marital counseling, which is pretty strange for a lot of people since I'm not married yet myself. Uh, but you know, God said it and that settles it. So uh, just in obedience, this is a, a special area of focus and I love speaking about this. But once again, this is great stuff to understand now. And because I sit down with people constantly and have these conversations, and I've seen what really works, what really gives people, you know, a kind of a fresh start because what flies in the face of normal traditional therapy when it comes to marital counseling or normal therapy is that, you know, we spend so much time on the problems and helping people to manage the problems better and, and a bunch of stuff where we actually blow up these problems. What every single couple that's going through a rough patch is looking for is a fresh start. And so... We'll get into that and I think the two things that I want to speak on will help couples to have a fresh start. So not necessarily going in deep into these problems and you know feeding that monster and helping it to become even bigger. But when we understand certain things and we get a, a proper lens to look through at certain problems and challenges that couples often experience, um, it gives us a fresh start. So I want to share two of these principles that I believe is extremely important to understand um, and I'm going to show you that from scripture. So in the first place, the first thing that I want to talk about is the love and respect cycle. So some of you might have read the book of Emrich Emerson called Love and Respect. Great, great read. So if you like what I'm going to say next and you're interested in that, maybe make sure to pick up that book. That's a really, really good read. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a summary. And so what the book basically says about this love and respect cycle is we are human beings and a natural need for all of us, okay, we know this from scripture as well, is unconditional love that we have in the Father and unconditional respect. And so we both need those, but men and women need them in different quantities. Men need respect much more and women need affectionate love much more. But there's a cycle going on the whole time. If you can picture them, this is love, unconditional love. This is unconditional respect. And you draw a little bit of an arrow here and an arrow there. And this is a cycle that keeps on continuing. So 
you know, what I often find when people come in for, for marital counseling is that they are stuck and the cycle has, you know, ground to a halt, if I said that right. Okay, so all of a sudden the cycle is not moving because here's the thing, the, the wife will say, okay, but you know, I know that I should probably respect my husband, but it's very, very hard for me to respect him because he's not showing me any respectful behavior. Um, and a man will say, okay, no, I know I should be, you know, I should treat my wife better. I should show more affectionate love. I should speak to her in a more tender way. Um, but man, she keeps on moaning all the time and she keeps on telling me what I should do. And it's really, really hard to give affectionate love because I'm not respected. So once again, we have a different need when it comes to that as men and women. Okay, men need respect more. It's a bigger need for us and women need affectionate love more. And so the book goes on to say, you know, that we have these earpieces, blue earpieces and pink earpieces. So men hear certain things differently to women and women hear, uh, you know, stuff different as well. And so there's something when it comes into that love and respect cycle. And I want to show you this from scripture because, um, you know, we don't want to think of this purely in a psychological sense or just in, in, in mere knowledge. We want to look at the word because this is the truth. And so I want to start with a piece of scripture and so I'm just going to run through it and, and point out some stuff. Try not to give my own opinion on this. Literally let the word um, interpret the word. And one of the most complete pieces of scripture when it comes to marriage is Ephesians 5. And especially uh, from verse 21. And it starts off by saying, Be subject to one another and listen to the motivation why we should be subject to to one another now that immediately flies in the face and you know one, another thing that that's very very prevalent and prominent when people come in for marital counseling is that one of some of the first words that will come from their mouths is you know this person is not fulfilling my need this is something that I need and he's just not giving me what I need and this is what I need and she's not giving it so people are really really focused even when I do marriage preparation I'll often ask people, you know, why do you want to get married? And they'll say stuff like, you know, I want someone to share my life with and I want someone that I can grow old with um, and I want once again someone that I can share these experiences with. So I need this, I want this. So the focus is on getting my needs met. And that's one of the things, you know, if we as a human race have one psychological disorder, or one sin, if you want to speak in a spiritual sense, is self-centeredness, okay? We are focused on looking out for number one. It's all about me, it's all about getting my needs met, and that's unfortunately how most people approach marriage, is I want something, or someone that will fulfill my needs. I want this, and I want this, and this is what I want in a wife, and this is what I want in a husband, and so the focus is on getting my needs met. And so it starts off by saying, be subject to one another, which means I'm going to be the less important one. Like Andy Stoney likes to say, it's a race to the back of the line. I'm not going to focus on getting my needs met. I'm going to focus on meeting this person's need. Isn't that the agape love, the self-sacrificing love that Jesus came to demonstrate so well? Is he said, I'm going to lay down my life and we'll see it in a year as well so that this person can live. So first of all, be subject to one another and listen to the motivation behind this. It says, out of reverence for Christ. Why should we be subject to one another? Because of our reverence, our love for Jesus Christ. So it all starts with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, every now and again, when people are very surprised, I've had this experience where we've gone through a whole coaching process or a whole counseling process with people and after we've helped them to get, you know, get a fresh start, get some incredible results, enjoy one another again and whatever, these people are very surprised often to hear that I'm not married and they say, how do you know this or, how, you know, uh, why are you able to do this, you know, you're not married um, uh, and, you know, I often tell them and there's a little bit of secret that I can share with you guys as well, I've been married for the last 25 years. And so like the Bible says, my life has been married to Jesus Christ. And so I've been in a successful intimate relationship for the last 25 years. 
and this is everything that I need to know to have a great relationship with people around me, I can learn here. And that's something that a lot of people don't truly get because they keep on looking for uh, what they need in human relationships when God gave us this very first primary, this is our first need. We, we have a longing and a desire for intimacy with God and everything flows from that. Because I have a great relationship with God, I can have great relationships with people. So out of my reverence for Christ, I will treat people with love and respect. Okay, so getting back to marriage, it says, Wives, be subject, be submissive and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. This is the par perspective or this is the paradigm that we should have as wives. I am going to be subject to my husband out of once again as a service to the Lord. Now, I, I, I love this, that the, the focus is not on getting my needs met or on, even on this person. It's my, my service to God is being a great wife to my husband. And in the same way, you know, this is often something that I will ask um, every now and again. It's women that come for marital counseling and the husband is not willing to come because he doesn't want to go to another guy that's going to solve the problem because he needs to feel like the hero, part of the respect um, need. But they will come and they will actually tell me, I said this, I told him to do this. And in the way that she's describing what, you know, how she approaches her husband, I can hear that she's violating the, his need for respect. Um, so that's a very, very interesting thing. But and, and then what I would ask is, you know, you spoke to your husband in this way. Would you speak to God that way? And they're like, okay, but it's not the same. God is God and my husband is useless. <laughs> okay, so it's the same thing. If you are a Christian and you're looking to do marriage according to God's model, this says that we should treat our husbands like we would treat the Lord. This is a service to God. You know, I, I love the example of Joseph in Potiphar's house. Now, when he was being seduced by Potiphar's wife, you know, a lot of teachers would say something, yeah, we don't know, she was really ugly, you know, why could he resist it like that? Um, I personally believe, scripturally, it says there that I believe that, you know, the most powerful man in, you know, in the world at that stage didn't have an ugly wife, okay? I'm, I'm assuming she was very desirable. And so, but Joseph's response to that was, how can I do this and sin against my God? His focus was not on, you know, I don't want to make part of her angry or I shouldn't do this. What it was, how can I do this to God? So his focus and why he could stand strong under that temptation was his focus was on his relationship with God. And so the same thing is when we're in a marriage, one of the keys to marriage is, is, is understanding and grasping that this is not necessarily about the relationship. This is about my relationship to God. And if one of the primary purposes for marriage is to glorify God and to show people uh, a clear physical manifestation of God's love in the earth. Okay? And that becomes our focus. Okay? Our focus will be on glorifying God and not necessarily on the faults and mistakes and getting my needs met and all of that. All right, but let's go on. So, verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. So, this doesn't mean that a husband is more important. It says this is a function. If this marriage is going to display God's design or God's model, um, you know, once again referring to our relationship with Him, okay, this is just a functional role so that the world will be able to see the manifest love of God in the earth. And so it goes on, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Okay, so there's the woman's part. There's the woman's part. So we'll get to the respect now as, as we go through the scripture. Now, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, your number one responsibility is to speak to the affectionate love of, with affectionate love, speak to the need of your wife like Christ did for the church, which meant, he, what, was the, you know, what was the example of Christ? He laid down his life so that we could live. 
So husband, your main responsibility is to love your wife, to lay down your life so that she will be able to live. And I love what it says next here. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. Now, that's a completely rich scripture. And obviously, it speaks about the power of the word and how he's sanctified by the word. But in this instance, I think a principle that we can safely take from that as well. He's saying that one of the most prominent ways that you as a husband can speak to the affectionate love of your wife is by the words that you use. The way that you speak to her is that cleansing her, is that sanctifying her, her is that building her up. Okay, the same goes in the same respect in a massive, massive sense as well, ladies, is, you know, the words that you use. Do you use your words in a way that makes your husband feel like a hero, respected, uh, like, you know, honor is a very public thing. Um, okay, let's get back to scripture. It says that he might present the church to himself in a glorious splendor without spot and wrinkle or any such things. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. You know, <laughs> this whole woke culture and feminist, you know, is, you know, standing up for my own rights. I'm not going to allow him to trample or walk over me and everything. But here's the husband's when a husband gets this, he will not walk all over his wife because he will love his wife like his own body. Okay? So, he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and carefully protects and cherishes it, as Christ does the church. That's another principle. You should love yourself before you get into a relationship. If you know, can't love yourself, that's why I'm talking about, once again, the most important relationships is, you know, our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves, and then our relationships with everyone else. Okay. And so it goes on to say, um, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall join or be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. And like I said, then I read that uh, scripture about this is the mystery that is very great. And I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. And then the summary of all of this is saying, however, let each man love his wife, being in a sense his very own self. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband. So there you go. Get it? The word says men should love their wives and wives should respect their husbands. So the Bible had it right. And even though once again, the social scientists or the social researchers would tell you that's exactly right. Okay. Men need respect more. That's why the Bible says respect your husband and women need affectionate love more. So that's why the Bible says husbands love your wives. Incredible how the truth um, has been around for thousands of years and the Bible always has it right and everything else is catching up with the Bible. So once again, the focus on, and I think the, one of the most important things that we can say about this, and you know, in my experience, especially in working um, with women, like I said, it's not because uh, I'm going to pick on the women. No, there's just more women that come and say, listen, we need help with our marriage. Uh, than husbands. But what I often see is we as Christians, we really get and we understand that we should love people unconditionally. So people shouldn't earn our love. Okay, If we're going to love the way that Jesus Christ loved, it's laying down our lives, not fighting for our own rights. Okay, And we love unconditionally. But ladies, do you realize that according to this scripture, the Bible speaks about unconditional respect as well? unconditional, which means your husband does not have to earn this before you decide to give him respect. If you come from a place of reverence to God, you will respect your husband regardless of if you feel he is respect worthy. And so that's what I hear from a lot of women and say, okay, I, I really struggle to respect my husband because he doesn't do this and he always does this and, and focusing on a lot of his behaviors. And so if you really want to live our lives and order our lives according to God's pattern, to God's model, it says here, yeah, wives, you should show your husbands unconditional love. And this is why it's important. God created the cycle. God designed this cycle. 
that in what that's why most couples are in a stalemate because the woman says I'm not gonna respect my husband because he's not giving me any respect with him okay and because the, the husband does not get any respect he cannot reciprocate with affectionate love so that's where the cycle is stuck and so what he also says in the book, uh, which is very, very good, it does not always take two to tango. If one person, one of the spouses, one of the partners understand this one principle, that I should speak unconditionally to his respect, and I should speak unconditionally to her need for love and affection, then the cycle can start up again. And the more I respect my husband, the easier it is for him to show me unconditional love. And the more I... I, you know, as a husband, speak to the need of my wife's affectionate love, I speak to her tenderly, I give her quality time, I help out around the house, there's a lot of different ways that you can speak to the affectionate love. The more I do that, the easier it will be for her to respect me and all of a cycle, all of a sudden the cycle can start turning again. So once again, unconditional love and unconditional respect. So if I can give you a little bit of a practical challenge, is to go and experiment with this. You know, instead of complaining about him leaving his underwear on the floor or he's always watching TV and he never wants to spend time with me or the kids or he never wants to be home, instead of doing that, choose unconditional respect. Even if you just do this for this holiday season or for the next two weeks and see what the response will be. The moment that you simply focus on everything that's respect worthy, even if you feel it's not great, it's just reinforce that part. And men, same story, even if you get no respect from your, from your wife, start doing small things in the way that you talk to her, in the way that you help out around the house. You know? Speak to that affectionate love, regardless of the treatment that you're getting from her. Then in actual fact, you're doing exactly what the Bible says. You lay down your own life, you die to self so that this person can live and see if more respect doesn't come your way. All right, so that's pretty much the first principle. The second thing that I want to talk to you about um, is that of moods. And so a lot of people kind of disregard moods as this is just something that, that happens, so we shouldn't give a lot of attention. It's not something that's very important, but in, in actual fact, it's extremely important. So mood is defined as our most conscious thought and our most prominent emotion. So thoughts and feelings create a whole mood. And mood is something that varies. Mood is something that does this all the time. Okay, we know this from life as well. Life is hills and valleys. So we are gonna be up and we are gonna be down on a daily basis. We're gonna do that in a week. You're gonna see that your moods fluctuate and the reason why your moods fluctuate is because your thoughts fluctuate. So although the Bible tells us, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ, we don't always have control of whatever comes into our minds. And so we are going to be faced with a lot of different thoughts. Our responsibility is to pay attention to these thoughts and to take them captive and to make them obedient to the truth, to Christ. But our moods are going to do this. And you know, in one of the most biggest problems or one of the most prominent reasons why depression and anxiety and all these psychological orders, disorders are so rife at the moment especially is because people don't get this concept of moods that's up and down. There's a big difference between me experiencing, um, you know, feelings of depression, because that's all of us, okay? All of us, every now and again, experience emotions of depression. That's exactly when our mood is low, okay? High mood, low mood. And so whenever it's low, we are gonna experience depressive um, thoughts and uh, emotions. And that's normal, and that's the problem with a lot of, um, you know, diagnosis. You know, I can have a conversation with someone, and like I said, that's the difference between me and a lot of psychologists. So I can listen to everything, and I can say, okay, you have depression. And the problem with that is the moment that you align with that belief of, I have depression, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so the moment that you start seeing yourself as a very depressed person, a person that struggles with anxiety, you're going to experience more of that in your life as the reticular activating, in your system, uh, reticular activating system in your brain is being turned on and it searches out similarities. If you believe the lie that you struggle with depression, your brain is going to go on autopilot and it's going to focus on everything that's wrong in your life. L look at how people are, you know, you're treating me. Um, what is up with my life? I, you know, I'm not excited about my future. 
And so um, if we can just realize that it's normal for mood to do this, okay, it's a very important thing to understand. So in a high mood, I'm all inspired, I'm creative, nothing is to be, I can face anything with my God, I will run through a wall uh, or jump over the wall. Um, with my God, I can do anything. And then low mood says, you know, you know, I don't feel great about myself, I don't feel great about my life. And that's kind of normal, okay? That's the first thing that I want to point out. We are going to do this. And the reason why this is so important for relationships is most people that struggle with a lot of relational problems have spent way too much time communicating and interacting when they're in a low mood. This is pretty much the one of the most important things that you can realize. If you can get very, very sensitive to the fact that your partner's mood is going to do this. And whenever it's low down there, what's the first thing that we want to do when we realize that our partner's you know, are in a low mood. We want to try and pull them out. Now that, unfortunately, because that can be so strong, that's unfortunately like a three-year-old trying to pull a, a very fat person out of a pool. Okay, what will happen more often than not is the kid will be uh, pulled into the pool. And so once again, the last thing that we should actually try and do is to try and pull someone out of a low mood. If we get this one thing, this very simple principle, is that that mood is going to change. That person might be down now, but they are going up again. And then whatever happened here can be seen. You know, we can talk about this. We can find some solutions to that but because the person will be much more open to think clearly. Um, I always refer to you have an ape brain and you have a brilliant mind, which is the mind of Christ. Okay, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. So, okay, I want to make my decisions or have my most difficult conversations in a high mood when I have my brilliant mind when, mind when I'm under the leading of the Holy Spirit instead of this because what happens when you're in a low mood the natural thing that happens in your brain all of a sudden um, the velocity of thoughts changes which means once again I will have a thousand thoughts have you noticed this uh, when you get very angry or very sad you know there's a thousand thoughts going through your mind all the time okay it gets really really busy in my mind so the other thing that happens is that there will be a sense of immediacy so I need to do something now that's why we make some of our most rash decisions why we say things we don't mean um, while we throw stuff around when we're mad okay we feel like immediately something needs to happen all right so that's another thing that happens in a low mood okay so a lot of thoughts okay a lot of negative thoughts third thing it's all about the problems it's all about my dissatisfactions um, there's nothing great about this and that's a normal way of thinking for someone that's in a low mood okay and so the third thing that happens is because I become all insecure I start looking at my own mistakes I start feeling bad about myself so those four things are very very natural when you're in a very low mood so the number one thing that you can do for yourself right there when you realize that you are in a low mood is just, okay, just calm down. I'm not going to take my thoughts seriously. I'm not going to speak rashly. I'm not going to do, I'm going to be very aware of, you know, I want to take these thousand thoughts and I want to get them to a place of a high mood where we focus on one thing at a time. That's a great way, practical way of getting yourself out of a low mood is instead of focusing on a thousand things, pick one thing and Put some effort into it that's why you know scripture is such a great thing so when I'm in low mo low mood and I you know feel like I need to get myself out there one of the best things that I can do is to um, set myself apart to get away from people get away from life and go spend some time on scripture because this is one thing that I can focus on right now one thing and so when I'm in a low mood I want to make sure that I get out of that like I said focus instead on one thing calm down, chill, I don't have to do something, be aware of that sense of immediacy that I need to do something now. Um, once again, I don't want to trust my thoughts if they are going to be focused on all negative and you know everything that I'm dissatisfied with in my life and the devil comes along in that low mood and says you're an idiot, you're ugly, you're not intelligent and all those thoughts of insecurity. Um, you know, I'm not going to take them seriously because I realize that I'm in a low mood. 
All that I need to do is focus on getting out of the low mood and then I can use my brilliant mind or I can be sensitive to the mind of Christ in me. And so understanding that will give us a lot of grace that the moment that our partners are in a low mood, okay, we want to be there with warmth, with understanding, which means if they say something rude towards me, if they insult me in some way, okay, I'm going to have the grace that the Bible talks about, okay, that says love in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love chooses to believe the best about every person, that I will be in a place where I say, okay, this person is just in a low mood, they're not they don't really mean what they just said. Okay, I'm going to overlook that offense. There's a scripture in Proverbs as well that says, um, you know, a man's honor is, it's a man's honor to overlook an offense. So I'm not going to, I'm going to overlook that offense. I'm not going to be mad because what they, they said, and what I'm going to do is a, a very wise thing to do is kind of stay back and allow them to go through the low mood because I know that the mood is going to change. Once again, mood is, I love the Mark Twain had a quote where he said, if you don't like the weather in New England, just wait a while because the weather is going to change as well. If you don't like the weather, the weather is going to change. So if you have the same mindset when it comes to your partner and saying, okay, my partner is going to experience high moods and low moods and that's normal. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. Okay. They are going to go through some stuff. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them some space and when they get into the high moods again, I can voice some you know sensitive topics and I can communicate in an assertive way. So the bottom line there is I want to have all my interaction with my, with my spouse or with my partner, preferably when I'm in a high mood and when they are in a high mood. And so once again, this is where our forgiveness, uh, you know, choose to believe the best about every person. There's some very irrational behavior that happens there, but I'm going to overlook it because I know that this person, whatever they are saying at the moment, they don't mean it. You know, I, you know, every now and again in couples counseling, uh, people say the worst things to each other. They will say stuff, obviously not in the session, but they'll bring up some memories where um, a spouse said, I wish I never married you. You are the worst person that I know. They say terrible things for each other and to each other. And once again, they obviously do that from a place where they're in a low mood. So what we want to do is try to limit the interaction when we're in a low mood and focus on having our best communication, our best interactions, our best times in a place where we're in a high mood. And that's once again where emotional intelligence comes in, that when I realize that I'm in a low mood, I want to do some things to get myself out of this mood into a high mood. And whenever I see that in my partner, I'm going to ignore most of the stuff that happens there. I'm going to be warm, understanding, maybe this, uh, you know, a respectful sense of humor can help get someone out there. But once again, the main responsibility is not getting that person or pulling that person out of it, but waiting for the mood to change until I am to interact there. That's a very, very practical piece of advice. But once again, proof is in the pudding. Um, so I want to challenge you to go and experiment with those two. Give unconditional love, unconditional respect, and try and be very, very aware of a low mood and a high mood. And uh, I would love to hear when you go and implement this. I've experienced this. I've seen this way too many times to doubt that it works and it's very effective. And so uh, I would love to hear when you go and experiment with some of this. Um, look to, hope to see you guys soon. Have a great day and uh, God bless.